Thanks. <clears throat> I'll try to, I'm in, a, I'm in a really tough position here after that wonderful presentation and then the teaser of the beer. And of course, uh, following me is what everyone's here to find out is how the winter is gonna be. So <clears throat> no pressure on you, Nick. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this, is, this is somewhat of an evolving presentation and, it, and it's splintered in a couple of different directions. It, it's gonna end up resulting in something that's much more geared towards a professional. But uh, how I uh, initially got here was I was contacted and said, would you like to present at NSA and maybe talk about avalanche control, um, maybe specific to highways. And, and I think most of you are fairly familiar with avalanche control, um, especially to highways. You know, I always get like, oh, you're, you guys have the big guns. You know, you're the guy with the tank. And uh, I'm sure a few of you have seen the tank. And I'm sorry to say it left this summer. Um, it went, went to the graveyard of tanks. Um, but I, I thought it'd be nice to do something that was a little more specific uh, component of, of avalanche control, and that's ski cutting. And uh, it's something that's employed quite a bit throughout ski areas and, and even highway operations or guiding operations. Um, and this is, to be clear, it is intentionally triggering avalanches to reduce the avalanche hazard. Um, this is not something I would condone any of you use in the backcountry. I don't either in the backcountry because it does present some risk, not only to yourself, but to others out there. So much more in a, in a controlled environment. Um, here we go. There's a little ski cutting shot for you. So what we're, what we're gonna go through is what is ski cutting? That might be uh, come as a surprise to some people that, that intentionally triggering avalanches is, is done with skis. Something that many of us, particularly in our, our early days getting into uh, backcountry skiing and, and taking our level ones, we're taught to avoid completely and that's kind of the the point of it when we're skiing the backcountry I know it is for me as well as not to trigger avalanches um, so yeah usually that first first reaction is wait you, you do what and isn't that dangerous um, and and there is a, a, a component of it that could be dangerous but we'll get into into that in the training aspects and, and some of the precautions that we take um, we'll also look at how it's applied operationally and, and I'll give a couple of examples a, a highway operation example and a ski area one that um, might tie in a little bit, particularly to what, uh, what Bram was saying about Alpenthal earlier, very you know, popular area heading up towards uh, Snow Lake and Chair Peak. Uh, kind of the, the types of conditions, I had a, a put out a little survey this summer to other professionals and, and looked at what types of, of avalanche problems uh, ski cutting is most uh, likely used and or not used. And then it's some, a little bit about training and experience, and you know that feeds in somewhat into what Ava was saying with the, the training and the coaching, because it is a long process, and it does take uh, quite a bit of experience to become uh, proficient at ski cutting. And then, as I said, where this happens, um, and maybe a conclusion or two, or hopefully no time for questions. <laughs> um, so you've probably seen this, these diagrams before uh, or some variation of this and how we determine risk. And that's a combination of hazard and exposure. And uh, operationally, you know, we're, as forecasters, we're always looking at this, 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 this hazard component, the likelihood of triggering an avalanche and, and the destructive size, and then the exposure. And particularly in the exposure is time. And, and we try to manage that risk uh, through various ways. One of them with time is through closures. We close ski runs, we close highways, um, but that is not usually a long-term uh, solution to the problem. You know, over time, the, the avalanche hazard likelihood and the destructive size will decrease, um, or most likely will decrease, and, and that's where, where that time element comes in. Two great examples with highways are, are Chinook Pass and, and North Cascades Highway. The, the hazard there is, is really unmanageable in, in um, you know, any practical sense. So the time aspect, those highways are closed throughout the winter. With ski areas and, and say, you know, I'll use I-90 as an example, because I'm sure majority of you have been stuck on I-90 before. Uh, time isn't really the best solution. So it comes back over to addressing the hazard. And that's uh, really is reducing or eliminating the destructive size of the avalanche through intentionally triggering uh, slides. Oh, and I was afraid some of these some of these slides might be a little washed out, but there is a, a very small avalanche there below his skis. Um, 
But how we do this is, uh, is very simple. We go out and we ski across the top of a slope in, in hopes of triggering an avalanche and, and that one that we are not going to be caught in. And there are, as I said, there are certain conditions that really lend themselves to this. Um, go back here. The, uh, the increased likelihood, the sensitivity of the snow is really important. Having, having conditions that are very sensitive, um, is, it makes it much easier to trigger avalanches and it's, it's far more predictable and manageable that way. The uh, smaller size of avalanches is, is quite important. We're not going out and, and triggering D3s uh, with our skis. It's just, uh, it's, you know, it's just unrealistic to do that. I actually learned uh, this a uh, week or two ago that in British Columbia, professionals are, are actually prohibited from tr ski triggering anything over a 2.5, a 2 which, uh, which, you know, it's getting to be a pretty good slide as it is. 1.5? Oh, thank you. Correction, 1.5. That seems, that seems more reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Johan. Um, and then very consistent conditions. We want, those, we want the consistency as we're moving across a slope. We don't want that variability. Um, we we want to be able to approach the, the problem and, and have very good likelihood of triggering slides, whether it's a slab initiation or, or loose snow. So in this, uh, in this survey I put out, I had 68 people, 68 professionals respond, and uh, one of the, the the big questions I was looking at is what types of, of avalanche problems are, are ski cutting being used? I know what the types of avalanche problems that, that I address, uh, both the highway and, and in my years at Alpental. And, and the answers uh, were very consistent. As we move around the dial there clockwise, uh, we see quite a few respondents came back for dry loose and, and storm slab. Those conditions, you know, lend themselves again back to that consistency, um, and they're and they're manageable. Probably everyone in here has had some experience with triggering a dry loose, like what we generally refer to as a slough. And on a bigger slope, that could be more of a problem. But um, that is one way when snow before it, it it stabilizes into a slab, we go out and we just start moving that loose snow and uh, and reducing the uh, the size or potential for an avalanche. <clears throat> Um, in addition, wet loose, as we're moving down, those are, ski cutting is very effective in wet loose uh, conditions, actually much more effective than, than bombs can be, like hand charges. And uh, in an operation like Chinook Pass, we use quite a bit of ski cutting to, to address the wet loose problem. I was, at first, I was a little surprised to see so many people respond to cornices, and then I had to correct myself and realize they're not the cornices we saw in, in John Scurlock's presentation that people are ski cutting. These are small cornices, um, usually, you know, at the top of a ski run or something like that. Not those big ones hanging over cliffs. So those are definitely uh, places for explosives. <clears throat> and then along that line is wind slab. And, and wind slabs, again, uh, we're looking at newer, fresher wind slabs and, and not these old hard ones that are that where we lose that consistency and ability to trigger. Um, Persistent slab did come in, and, and initially I was a little surprised, but as I looked into it more, it was, it was more like recent storm snow over a persistent uh, grain type like surface hoar, and, and that can be easily triggered. Um, I did get one pers deep persistent slab, or no, actually, no, sorry, a couple on wet slabs, which I would say is you're starting to get into riskier terrain with, with wet slabs, and it become uh, not only less predictable and triggering, but uh, more potential for being caught due to the heavy, heavy snow. <clears throat> I was uh, quite pleased to see that deep slabs, deep persistent slabs, and glide avalanches, nobody responded. And uh, so th that, was, uh, that was reassuring. <laughs> and if this shows up a little bit, this is kind of a, just a, a typical example of a storm slab uh, ski cutting. The patroller is, is high in this little pocket. Uh, up near the cliffs, about where the uh, where the slide's going to break, and as she moves forward, the the slab initiates and then and begins to pull away. Um, these are you know in a ski area operation like this, these are typically used between shots. You might have a larger slope where where a hand charge or a tram is used to trigger trigger the avalanche. And then in between, there's little pockets that need to be cleaned up, like we're seeing here. The other uh, the other one, as I mentioned, the wet loose. And this one's, I'm sure, I'm sorry, is uh, quite washed out. But <clears throat> if we could see here, lower in this, on that picture is a, is a crown of an older slab. 
So we initially address this slope, a deeper instability using explosives, because it's, it's far more safe for us. Triggered that slide, um, a few days later we came back, the, the new snow over the top of that uh, slope had become uh, wet and loosened by the uh, warm temperatures and solar activity. And at that point, we're just skiing across the slope and, and pushing that, that wet, loose snow. Uh, you can see a little bit that the skier's downhill ski is up, and he's, he's lifting his ski to keep that heavy, wet snow from, from dragging his ski down. It allows him to keep his, uh, his momentum and his traverse across the slope. I did mention the, uh, the amount of training and experience that goes into this, and, and here's, uh, this is the number of days that people ski cut per year. We see the responses and the number of days. And the majority of the respondents were in, let's say, 20 to 40 days per year that they're actively ski cutting um, in their operations. More so is the years of experience, and uh, quite a few years of experience. You know, it's, it's something that uh, it, it does take time. There was a narrative component to the survey, which I, I'm not, I don't have the, to share that here with you today, but um, in response to training, there was, yeah, there was quite a bit of like, this is a real art. It's not a, it's not a skill that's, uh, it, that's easily taught, that you, you, nothing you could learn in a classroom. It takes, takes time, it takes that, tra that coaching aspect of it, and a lot of familiarity with the snow and your ability to move across the slope. This is a, a highway example of, of Chinook Pass. You can just kind of see the, uh, the, the slight bench of the highway. It's uh, mid-track through nearly 100 avalanche paths, um, a very solar-facing aspect overall. And uh, we use a combination of explosives and ski cutting there. You can see the, uh, the slides going down to the, the valley bottom. So what's initiated as a very small uh, avalanche at the top of the slope can run uh, you know, 2,000 feet to the valley bottom. And uh, this, this takes place uh, throughout April and May and, and even into early June, depending on, on the snow cover that year. And that's just a, an example of a, of a ski route that we would use and uh, you know, would easily get conditions that would, would slide right to the valley bottom. And again, another, just another view of some of the slopes there. As you can see across moving from the top of the slope down, uh, just a lot of terrain in there that to, to try and effectively control that with explosives would, would just take far too long and, and wouldn't really be that effective. Um, the skis can really push quite a bit of snow through there. And just another route there. And we do, and I'm, I'm sure some of you have probably seen a, a post that I've done each year on turns all year showing the, the operational area. And I hope to update that in the futures, much like the, the, the panel discussion that was here, um, there are some, some you know, risks to take and hazards to take into account if you're going into this area in the spring while we're operating, not only from the ski cutting, but from the heavy equipment that's, that's pushing snow from the road. And then finally, uh, I have, I'm, I'm glad that I get to have a John Skurlock photo in my presentation. <clears throat> and he mentioned some of the work he's done for the highway in, in the ski areas. and, and uh, this is the Alpenthal back bowls. Um, I don't think I have a, a pointer to point it out, but um, the prominent, prominent one the creek coming right down the middle is what uh, is trash can. Uh, Bram uh, Thrift referred to that earlier. And <clears throat> you can see the, uh, this blue line here shows the, the exit trail that, that the skiers downhill traffic uses. And quite a few uphill travelers use that trail. It's, it's, it's a trail that's in place. It's easy to follow. Um, as you can see, as you come out of the forest, down the lower part of the, the screen, uh, moving over to the far right, it, uh, you go from, from relatively flat ground in, in the timber into, uh, into some more exposed slopes. And uh, as, as Bram mentioned earlier, there have been some accidents and fatalities in there, not due to, to any operational aspect from the ski area, but just from, from natural activity. And, uh, and pretty small slope activity, nothing like coming from the very top of the ridge. So it, it, that is uh, important to consider in your, in your trip planning and take the lower route. And if you can see, uh, just below where the blue line starts to cut up is the, uh, is the more preferred route that goes lower. And then finally, I'm just gonna overlay what, what the uh, ski cutting routines look like in the back bowls at Alpenthal. And uh, we start adding quite a few passes through there. So you know, lots of uh, lots of potential if you're traveling up into that that zone when the ski area is operating to to uh, 
have some conflict with the patrollers there who are skiing in above you. I just kind of keep adding more and more. So that, that's kind of my overview of ski cutting. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, was, I happened to be in Austria a couple weeks ago at the International Snow Science Workshop and got this nice picture of a horse while we were looking at avalanche paths and nice green pastures and blue skies, which we seem to have lost now outside. Um, before I wrap up here, I do have one other little plug here, and this is for the Inter International Snow Science Workshop, um, which was just held, as I mentioned, in Austria uh, two weeks ago. The, the next one will be in uh, Fernie, British Columbia in 2020, and uh, it's, I think it's a very unique opportunity. Its location and the affordability of Fernie um, are going to allow the majority of North American practitioners to attend this conference and not only attend it, but uh, we really want to encourage practitioners to participate and present. Uh, the, the ISSW, the International Snow Science Workshop, is billed as a merging of theory and practice. And uh, it's always been a, a little bit of a challenge to get more practitioners to present. So this, this pitch is going out to all the practitioners here to start your, your studies, your researches now. You've got two winners to put it together. And uh, also tune into the Avalanche Review, the American Avalanche Association's publication um, this winter. And there'll be some additional information about putting you in touch with, with some uh, presenters, people who've presented at, at previous ISSWs, practitioners and researchers alike, and uh, people who may end up being your mentor someday, um, hopefully to, uh, to encourage that exchange. And that's all I have. <laughs>